Welcome to track number two of the Dream Church. Number one, 25 reasons why we must have a big church. Number one, because it is the will of God. Hallelujah. It is the will of God. Amen. Is it the will of God? Do we read it in the Bible? Number two. Because it is the the population of the world is increasing every day. The population is increasing every day. Every day of my life. I am blessed every day. Huh? Now, Pastor Richard, which country do you come from? I mean, what's your home country? Ghana. When did you leave Ghana? Did you live in Ghana? Yeah, I live in Ghana. Do you live in Ghana? No. You do not live in Ghana. When did you leave Ghana? 1993. 1993. You departed. <laughs> But not as a slave. Okay. Now, one question. In 1990, what was the population of Ghana? For three points. Twelve million? Fifteen? 1990, ten years ago? How many remember when the population of Ghana was 9 million, 8 million, 9 million? You remember? When was that? In the 80s. What's the population of America? 250 million. And what was the population of America some years ago? It's been about the same for, me, for a long time. Oh, really? Well, it's approaching 300. Well, in some places they are practicing a lot of family planning. And some places they are just going for it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, those who are going for it are outstripping those who are doing the family planning so in the end we are having more people on earth recently we said this year we celebrated 7 billion people on this planet 7 billion people was it 6 billion 6 billion all right a few years ago we were 5 billion four or five years ago now we are 6 billion so we've added a billion a billion billion people and people are just being born all the time there's no space for people and if we have the same size of church that we had 10 years ago that we have now you get it are we doing anything in Ghana we have a government who like giving statistics that are impressive to the uninformed <laughs> you get it the government the government for instance they 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 they, they, they say um now they say you know we have three universities now they say now we have five or six but these three new universities that they say they've added to the universities. One was an agricultural college which they've painted. <laughs> Another was a teacher training college which has also been renovated and painted. <laughs> and then another was what? This two they've added. Another was also a, a teacher training teacher training college. And the north was an agric- agricultural training 
college. So now I'm just saying something. You see, relatively, you, you you've painted a college over, and you say it's a it's a university, and we have more universities now. So under your regime, we have had more universities. We are not children. We are not children. Build a university. Go and buy land and start digging. And build a university and tell me that you've got a, you've added a university. You get what I say? So I'm just trying to say because you see, even in the church we see more people. But we are deceiving ourselves. Really sometimes we have fewer people. Yeah, right. Relative to the people who are there now, we are fewer. Yeah. But we, are, we, we pride ourselves in the fact that we see more people. It's very, very deceptive. For instance, this same government. Say, now the government is a very good example when you are preaching. That's why I, I can't avoid using them. So, in case you have a different political opinion, unfortunately, this is the best example I have, so I have to use it. <laughs> the, the, this same government, they now, when they are speaking about their achievements, they said, some years ago there were only... 5,000 people in all the universities, but now we have about 20,000, something like that. Now, these 20,000 people in our universities, you have a room that was meant for one person. Now it has changed to two, and now to four, and then now eight people in one room. In one university, it is said that one of the buildings is sinking into the ground. So it sounds like there's some growth. Because there are 20,000 people. That's really, the population has increased so much. And you are just squeezed more and more people into one place. Once lady was telling me, that we have a, a lecture. She said, Bishop, we have 1,500 people in the lecture. And I said, wow, is it a miracle service or a lecture? <laughs> A crusade. <laughs> so I'm saying that you see, in the church, when you come to the church, we, we shouldn't deceive ourselves. Sometimes when we see more people, you know, ten years ago there was no church like Lighthouse. Even the signs, there was nothing like that. Today there are several churches like Lighthouse, different different churches with different names, big churches all over the city, huh? But that doesn't mean anything really. Sometimes when you close, you realize that we have, we have even reduced relatively in, in, in relative to the population. We have actually gone down. You see, and that's why sometimes I, I look at America and I see some of the great men of God that came out from America. So when we say we need to have a mega church, we really need to expand because the population is is just growing, outstripping everything that we do. Explosive growth. One day I went to the labor ward, 25 people came to give birth that evening. You know, 25 people. <laughs> why, oh why, Superfly? <laughs> Alright, so that's the second reason. Reason number three. A mega church means that more souls are Established. Amen. More souls are what? Established in the church. Now, what does that mean? A mega church means more souls are established. The souls that are in the church, right, are the souls that have been established after evangelism has been done. Pastor Robbie, is that not so? After evangelism has been done, some people are left behind. So when you see more people, it means more have been left behind after all our efforts. So the church is the remnant of the evidence of your work and my work as pastors and shepherds. Amen. Amen. Alright. So we need to have larger church, not larger crusades. Because <laughs> you can have a large crusade but not a large church. I was in Colombia, I was in the city, Barranquilla, and the pastor was telling me, the large churches there are not very large. But crusades, 100,000 people. I saw it myself. You see this stadium which has one going around, and then the second level going around, and then the third level going around. All around, Colombia football stadium. Full of souls. 
waving flags and banners and singing with cripples, thousands of cripples. People with wheelchairs, ambulances, everything. People have come with faith. Large crusade is different from large church. The mega church means more than a mega crusade. The mega church means more people are established. Mega crusade means many people came for the program. That's all. But the mega church means that more people are actually settled in Christ. That's why the church must be big. Thank God for the big crusade, but what about the church? The church must be big. Amen. Are you glad about that? Alright, so mega church means more. How many reasons do you have? Reason number four. A mega church means more souls are saved. Salvation. There's been more salvation. Number five. A mega church means that more prayer goes on. There's more prayer. Amen. More prayer. When you have a big church, it means there's going to be more prayer. Why? Because <laughs> because when there, are, when there is a bigger church, right, there's more people available to pray. Right. right now, in our church, right, we, we have, we used to have or we, have, we always have a system of prayer duty. Every day there's somebody on duty to pray. We are changing that to something else, but it's still the same idea. But now I have a full-time prayer. Uh, uh, no, before that, I have a full-time prayer uh, where I have somebody who's employed to pray for me. In the church. Oh, yeah. Pray for me all the time. Amen. Uh-huh. Amen. But you can't employ somebody to pray if you don't have money to pay. So the person who prayed for me is not a, it's not a dropout from school or somebody that doesn't have to graduate from the university. In fact, a postgraduate has two degrees at the university. Prays for me and the church and the ministry. That's all. Prayer. <laughs> Now, I am forming a prayer army, full-time people. I'm going to get them to just pray. And I'll pay all of them to pray. Oh, yeah. Different from this one, another army. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it important? Oh, you have no idea. If you were to talk less, do less, and pray more, things will change. Oh yes. Oh yes. Prayer will make a lot of difference. I see you becoming a prayer warrior in Jesus' name. Amen. So when there's a mega church, you are praying in America. Our church in Geneva, I told them, never stop having that all night. Every Friday night, they go and shout. They have an engine room. You know, one, we had a, somebody in the church who introduced us to somebody. I mean, if you go over there all night, it's quite spooky. Because they have this engine room, a place where they learn mechanics, you know, how to be a mechanic. And that is where somebody opens for us every Friday. You turn off the lights, you know, you've been for that all night before. You turn off the light, they go in a very spooky way, you know. Just go to some, you know. So suddenly you don't shout, you don't make... Even if you flush the toilet after 10 o'clock, they can call the police. I'm surprised. Oh yeah, the toilet is disturbing everybody. You have people who come to a party with you, they'll dance with you, and everything, 10 o'clock they'll go. Then they'll go to the house and call the police to come on you. (laughs) Oh yeah. They don't want anything to disturb the environment that they have there. So we have a place, but we have a place when you hear the people ah, shouting and praying. It's an engine room inside somebody. Here. Every week they are there praying for the salvation of a lost city. Geneva was the ideal Christian city of the world in 15 something. It was declared to be the most ideal Christian city of the whole world. Today, they don't believe in God at all. You see, a lot of people, you say Switzerland, you say, oh, mountain, lake, this. Me, when you say Switzerland, something ugly appears before my eyes. Very nasty. Devils, occult, 
witchcraft. It's very, because I work there, not just, I don't just, I don't, if I have never gone for any tourism there. I just go in and out. And something very nasty. And it, that thing is so powerful, it's so strong, and has to be broken. It's only prayer, not preaching. Yeah. Preaching can't change it. Preaching can't change it. Jesus preached for just three years, three and a half years. And he's been praying for 2,000 years. He said, I'm going to, he'll ever live to make intercession. Mm. So calculate the ratio. Three and a half years of preaching and 2,000 years of praying. And you, look at your ratio. Uh, th- th- <laughs> three and a half years of preaching. And then five minutes. <laughs> five minutes of prayer. In fact, we, 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 when we do a calculation there, you realize that Jesus' prayer preaching ratio is so different from our lives. <laughs> Are you still around? Pinch the person next to you and say sorry. <laughs> Amen. Are you still around? How many want there to be a mega church so that there's more prayer? Prayer, 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 prayer. Prayer is the key to the ministry. Amen. The next one, how many reasons do you have? Number six, when there's a mega church, there's more faith. Number seven, when there's a mega church, there's more expectation. All right? Number eight, when there's a mega church, there's more power. The next one, number nine, when there's a mega church, there are more miracles. 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 Number ten, when there's a mega church, there's more testimonies. Testimonies. There is more testimonies. Amen. Amen. Listen. You know that when there are more people, there's more expectation. Sometimes you are driving by, you see a crowd gathered. What's going on? Must be something important. Straight away. That is why many great evangelists will not have programs in a big stadium. They prefer to have it in a smaller auditorium, which will be full. Because you, although you have, I know somebody who had a, a crusade. After I had a crusade in Barankia, he also came and had a crusade in the same stadium. But he had about 3,000 people at his crusade. Now 3,000 people in the stadium which seats 100,000 people. Brother, you are going to be depressed big time. <laughs> big time. But if we have 3,000 people here tonight... We may even have the police moving around and patrolling to see what's going on in this sounds cool. You see, so the crowd brings an expectation, an aura of expectation, faith. Your faith plus my faith times ten thousand. That is why the greater miracles you see them usually in larger crowds, because there's more faith, there's more power. Therefore, because there's more faith, there's more power. And because there's more power, there's more miracles. And because there's more miracles, there are more testimonies. More people are testifying. I was healed of this. I was healed of this. If I have a miracle service, we may have some testimony, something, one, two, three, and so on. We have a crusade, and maybe not, maybe, 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 maybe there may be no sick person here. Or the sickness, pimple, this, but nothing serious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when I went to Colombia, I tell you, the sicknesses that were there, even they brought the dead, the dead. The second day after the dead were raised on the first day, they brought a dead person. As soon as I arrived this day, they told me that it's a dead person that is, that, that is lying by the platform. They brought a dead person there for you to raise. I said, no problem, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. Next time I'm going to Colombia, make sure you come along. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So they come with expectation, power, miracles, testimonies. And we want, don't you want more testimonies? 
Don't you want more power? Even sometimes the man of God is not even anointed. The crowd itself will bring anointing. Many times, Catherine Kuman, the healings, even Benihin, they happen before they get to church. When they get to church, people have been healed. Powerful miracles. You see, the gathering of the crowd is such expectation. That's why Catherine Kuman never had a program in the, in the stadium, only in the church. She said, wonderful, thousands should go home. That place should be full, packed, expectation, atmosphere, charged. She had a program always in the church in Pittsburgh. I always go to a state of no. And if you are a pastor and you are organizing a program, be led before you go and do a program in the stadium. <laughs> that you could easily be depressed. That's why you must choose the size of the hall that you are going to have the program and even start in your church. If you are going to start a church, you don't go to a hall like this. No. Try your sitting room first. <laughs> See if your hall can be filled. When it's filled and it's working, then, then believe God and move to something else. Amen. Amen. So that when the place is full, there's more power, more miracles. How many reasons do you have? Ten reasons. Wow, we have gone very far. The next one, when there's more a uh, larger, what do you call it, uh, mega church, there's more evangelism. 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 Now, for the first time since our church began some years ago, we have our own crusade, you know, our own crusade trucks, our own vehicles. For crusades, we have so much investment in evangelism. We travel, evangelism, all the time. Expensive crusade. You, you have a large crusade, you take an offering, there's no money. Evangelism is one of the most thankless jobs. That's why there are very few evangelism, evangelists and a lot of pastors. Because if the pastor, the pastor will preach to the people and the people will love him. They will care for him. They will give him gifts. They will bless him. Oh yeah. That's why that's why many evangelists turned into pastors by accident. But the job was originally an evangelist. Hallelujah. The evangelist comes into town, he preaches once, twice, he's off. Power, people are healed, some are not healed. When it's time for questions, why, when also, I'm off, then he goes. <laughs> he's not around. <laughs> but the pastor will stay, will love the people, will care for the people. Will stand by the people. When they are down, he'll be there. When they are up, he'll be there. He'll be there to encourage them, to hold them, to cry with them. That's a pastor. You love your pastor. Oh, yes. That's why the evangelists are few and far between. Who's going to support the evangelist? He just came with his crazy idea to go and win some dinosaur in some dark jungle, which is very hard to find. Very dangerous to go to. But when you have a mega church, you can sustain it. Oh yeah. You know, you, you think, do you think we, we depend on the offerings from our crusade? Not at all. Every month from our church money, we pay a certain amount of money straight into the East Gospel Crusade account, direct. Buy all their tracks, all that. And in spite of all the money that we give them, they are always broke. <laughs> <laughs> and their offerings are equal to zero. You don't even calculate with it. Nothing, it can do nothing. Even the fuel, the petrol, the, what do you call it here? Gasoline. What? Yes. Gas. Yes. Gas. Yes. <laughs> you, you can't even buy gas. You can't even buy gas. <laughs> 
But you see, when the church is big, yeah. you can buy trucks, right. cars, pay money, pay people, pay a team. Let them travel, employ the right type of people to go. Because you see, for the crusade to work, the past, we have to send somebody who goes to the town and talks to all the pastors in the town. Sits down with them, meets with them. You have to be respectable for them to even take you seriously. You get it? And, and they have to take you seriously. You have to look decent. You have to be able to speak to them, talk to them, gather them, meet with them, keep them Coca-Cola and so on, meet with them and all that for them to, you know, be interested in the crusade. Gather around and gather the people, come, fix them. All that before the evangelists come. It's not a small job. You need somebody intelligent. You have to employ somebody to do that. Plus the people who drive the trucks. We have all these people employ them, the crusade director. We have to employ people to drive the trucks, the cars, to fix the stage, to fix the equipment, light, sound, electricity, chairs, everything. Fix the trucks. Oh, that is not a small thing. If you are a small church, you won't even think about, about that. It will be the last thing that will get you. So that's why God wants a mega church, because with a mega church, suddenly things that are impossible become possible. And those are things that are after God. God loves evangelism. Jesus came to this world to, to save sinners. Not to encourage believers, to save sinners. And we like staying amongst ourselves and encouraging ourselves. <laughs> loving ourselves. Caring for each other. How many feel that we need a, a, a mega church? You see, at a point, right, to have a evangelism, let's say right now in Africa, Hello? Hello? Can I speak to you, please? Can I speak to you? Are you on the line? Good. Give me a yellow card and a red card. I'm going to start giving yellow cards and red cards. <laughs> when I give you a yellow card, it means you must... Uh, you are warned. When I give you a red card, it means you must stand up. Okay. Now, uh, listen carefully. Are you there? Are you there? I'm telling you something. We are going for supper, but before we go, listen. Africa, today, I cannot go to... Sierra Leone. I cannot go to Liberia. It's too dangerous. We really want to go and have a crusade in that free town um, uh, place. Very dangerous. You can drive through. There are rebels in the jungle of many African countries today. A time will come where we may have to fly there. And some of these places, there are, no, there are no planes going there. And some of the planes are very dangerous. One Airways, I don't want to mention the name. Dangerous plane. <laughs> <laughs> dangerous plane. Well, listen, I don't want to mention the name for that airline, but the name starts with G. <laughs> One of my pastors... <laughs> One of my pastors was going from Accra to um, Côte d'Ivoire, Abidjan. But he, he had to go to Benin and then come. Now, once I've not mentioned the name of any plane, you don't, you don't know what plane it is. They were on the plane and they were going, just a couple of weeks ago, they were going, then they went to the runway, they were there. Then they started. Bricks, something was brought on the plane. Came back. Stop the plane in the middle of the runway on the other we're about to take off. Stop the plane. Came back. Um something is popped. So if you wait, a lot of people got off the plane. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and you hear the stuff of that airline when they hear of this plane has crashed and they say, Oh, that's this and you crashed. <laughs> you know, just a small thing and you crash. How should you crash with such a small problem? We we have mega problem with don't crash. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one day this uh, airways it was I think it was coming to America the person somebody was supposed to remove something from the wheel the person didn't remove it. So that's airways. Have, have, I, have I mentioned any name? Okay. <laughs> the floor is 
wheels. We couldn't go under. <laughs> oh yeah, serious. And they couldn't close down. They couldn't close and they couldn't land. So they had to go and land at another place. They had to fly to another country and land. Well, they were able to land and then remove the thing and then continue across the Atlantic. <laughs> I wouldn't want my pastor to be on that plane. Another time, I can tell you horror story after horror story. So, I was telling my pastor who was going to Nigeria, I said, Brother, it will be better to drive to Nigeria. <laughs> it will be better to drive to Nigeria from Ghana than to sit on that plane. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And the time may come where we may need to have our own plane or helicopter. So that if we, are, we have to go from here to here, we just, we just fly and work it, and one that works. One that is reliable. You just sit on the thing, you spark it's working, and then you are moving. But not something that you are not sure. Another time they were going, the weather, they said the weather was bad. And so when they, when they got up, they said they shouldn't have gone. So let's go. As they were climbing, they didn't even reach the, as they were climbing, the engine on this side went off. Off. So they were on the place, ah, from this uh, place to this place, ah, one hour, they have not reached, two hours, they have not reached, two and a half hours, they have not reached, because the only one engine was working on the plane. So when, when they land another, mm, <laughs> when they land, when they land the, because one engine is, one engine is pushing the plane, the, it goes off. So when they landed, mm, 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 <laughs> they bring it back to go off they bring it back several times I said this plane I told my brother I had a friend who was working I said my brother I pray for you to get another job <laughs> to fly on this plane oh yeah so when you look at many of these countries almost inaccessible look it's not easy to let somebody die and leave his wife and children, I've seen it. I've seen it. I've been, I've been there. I've watched it. I've had to stabilize. I've, I've watched people's wives as their husbands are dead. It's not. A, it's not. A, it's not. It's not an ordinary thing. So you wouldn't want it. We had a pastor in Sierra Leone. They almost killed him. When he came back, I said, "Mother, you are not going back." And of course, he didn't go back. His wife lived on the next road. I should send him there. And when they kill him and they, they bring him back, then what should I, the explanation should I give? A lot of things become impossible to a small organization. But a big organization, yeah, it can do it. So heli- because mines in Ghana have helicopters. They have planes. They fly across. Recently, one of, one of their private planes fell into the salt lake. <laughs> the private plane too was falling. Anyway, so it's... <laughs> It fell into the salt lake. <laughs> we have a salt, you know, place in Accra. So we need a mega. How many feel that we really need a big church? Yeah. We've got to be able to go to places. Because Christ did not just die for Americans. And for people who live in places where there are airports. Christ died for sinners. And that's why this church is here. I'm telling you that. If you don't know, I'm telling you why you are here. We are here because we are going to win the lost at any cost. I wrote a new book. We're going to print it. It's called Win the Lost at Any Cost. Uh, I've heard this story from other people, but this time I heard it. My, I, it wasn't a story. Somebody told me personally. He said to me, Bishop, I was at a, a place. He measured a place in Ghana. He said, a, he said it's a, a jura, and then you go more about four hours inside. He said, as, I, as we were going with the car, he said, when we get to certain villages, they begin to clap. God, they don't see cars. So they come. They don't see cars there. But in all those places, there were NDC posters. 
and this is the government uh, political party. Then he got to a place, and then he, he got down, and he was just waiting there. He did his project for his university, farming something. And he got down, and was, there was a boy, and the boy came. He called the guy and was talking. He said, do you know Jesus Christ he wanted to witness to him? He was talking with the guy, and then at the point the boy said, I'm coming. Ah, what is I'm coming? He said, I'm coming. So he went to the hut nearby, and he came with another man. And a guy came to ask, said, you are looking for who? <laughs> <laughs> you are looking for who? <laughs> he said, this one is not, a, it's not somebody else who is telling you. He said, he asked him, said, this Jesus Christ, do you know him personally? Does he stay around? Does he do? Do you know do you know him? If you see his face, will you know him? Will you know him? Does he stay in these houses? In the year two thousand, this 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 year, a few weeks ago, real life in a country today is asking that this Jesus Christ, is he does he stay in there? Is he sure that he stays here? <laughs> Oh, it's not funny, oh. It's not funny. And at that place, there were the NDC posters, and they have their pickups. You know, I was reading the newspaper, this political party, they imported 400 new double cabin pickups, 100 land cruisers for their elections. And they were asking them in parliament, how did they get the money to, to do all those things? Huh? And the police, they have 1954 land rovers. <laughs> When a political party has got more cars than the police, you have a problem. But as I look at this, and you see, it's, it's, it's not at a point, it's, it is no more fun. You must ask yourself that what does the church exist for? If I ask you now to leave America and come and darken the doorway at Accra Airport, you may say no. If you wouldn't go, at least you should be able to support for somebody else and not be annoyed when somebody is asking for support to do that. Of course. Because you see, you are, you are important to yourself. But people are elsewhere. They are also important to the world. They are also important human beings who live there. And even Jesus Christ, when you ask Jesus Christ, they ask you whether he is sure that Jesus Christ lives in this community. It's very serious. I mean, this guy was telling me, he's called Emmanuel. He, he, said, he said, Bishop, this one, I've heard it, but this one, I saw it real life. You see, and that is why, and, and these are the places that we need to go to such places. That's what we are here for. We need to go to every corner, every river. There are places in Ghana you cannot go unless you cross a river. On a boat, there's no car, there's nothing. There's no bridge. And you think you are the most important thing. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ died for the poor. And if anything, this part of the world, they don't even want to hear about this gospel. But there, they will even be more open. Amen. Amen. Are you still out there? So a mega church is one of the most important things. You see, that's why when, when, when the church is not big and strong and powerful, it's, it, it, it's, it's like a powerless organism. It's like a country without an army. The next reason why we must have a mega church is because we have more money in the church. Huh? It's not an army. More money in the church. How many feel that there are uses for money in the church? Huh? There's a lot of things that we need money to do. 
And by the grace of God, we are going to do it. We are going to do it. Whether you help or not, but I know that you are going to help. We have to. We have to. You have to understand, Pastor Obi, why you are alive. And why we are here. And why you are where you are today. You know, that's what the Lord was telling me. It was, he was showing me that people don't understand why they are around. Remind me to help you to know why you are around. Amen. Before we close the camp. Amen. To understand why you are around here. And you are around. I mean, when I say around, I mean you exist. And the fact that your existence is here. We need a mega church. Amen. Oh, we need a mega church. We need, we actually, it's actually God's plan. And Satan will do everything to divide us into little pieces and to break us up and to divide us and to scatter us and to prevent us from going and to take people away from the church. Satan, I am identifying him directly. He is the one because he knows. And when a church knows what it's about, look, thank God for Americans. They have been, they have even more missionaries. Like when you go to Asia, Africa, so many places, they send missionaries, missionaries. You meet many American families. They say, my father was a missionary here. My father was a missionary here. My mother was a missionary here. He died in Puerto Rico, in Panama, in this, in that. Plenty. They, today, brought, sent that gospel. Now, it's the turn of certain people to also go as missionaries. And we've got to do our part. We've got to do our part. It's our turn to do certain things. And we are going to do it. Stand to your feet. Just, just, just stand where you are and uh, no movement at all. Just let's close. Lift up your hands to the Lord. Just close your eyes and ask the Lord, please, Lord, if you can, if you can use anything. Use me to build a mega church. Use me to build your church, your kingdom. To do what I have to do, to do what is right, to be involved. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bresse l'ora, spresse l'orique, presta la mande, prustu shebekile, mandel piger belestes. Tabel debushi brdake pabru sedeliba. Mendil padre mes rabeke freka da bara doste. Chegel, Chagabas, Sebeketes, Kabakadas, Kola, Kebakatabo, Kumu, Kakayaka, Pasi, Capros, Peretis, Pagelis, Peristole, Stabres, Domigues, Stebales, Tubabes, Tebrumi, Marandes, Peligos, Keligres, Tarimboles, Tayele, Brates, De Dostes, Chibaidele, Bikes, Tumbres, Tambel, Lidi, Ketake, Bokede. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name, O God. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper into your word of truth. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper into your love for me. Draw me deeper, draw deeper to the place. This message continues on the next track. Keep listening.